We finish essentially the last two weeks all of the basics from fish to karyotyping, PCR, Sanger sequencing. And I think all that serves as a nice sort of foundation for what we're going to talk about next over the next four lectures, I believe. Uh, today, first thing will be Human Genome Project. And then maybe the second hour we'll go into the next gen sequencing platforms. Hopefully, Human Genome Project doesn't take the full hour. That way, it leaves us more time to talk about the different sequencing platforms. So, let's start first with the Human Genome Project. Any ideas when this started or what is it about? Any guesses? The idea started in the 80s. It was actually mid-80s that the, the department, U.S. Department of Energy, I think, came up with the idea that we should study the human genome in more detail. So the, the seed was planted then in the mid-80s. But the project really didn't, um, didn't go into effect really until 1990 was when it started. So 1990 is the official start date. Um, at that time, the head of the National Center for Human Genome Research um, was um, uh, Watson, James Watson. And he had sort of a run-in with, um, I forget her name, Healy, I believe. Um, I think it was the head of, maybe head of NIH, I'm, I'm blanking out here. But he had some run-in with somebody about gene patents. And I think he was against them. And because of that, he actually had to step down. And I think in 1993, uh, Francis Collins was the one who took over. So Watson was the initial sort of uh, head of the project, but Francis Collins was the one who, who took over in 1993. And this was an effort to sequence the human genome, um, but not to do the entire human genome, which is considered to be diploid, right? You get one copy from mom and one from dad. This was just to look at a haploid, just one copy, which, do you remember how big that is? Yeah. Yeah. So roughly, Three million bases, so three times ten to the ninth bases. Um, so they started at this time, and this I would lump together as sort of the public effort. So this effort is probably in world history the, one of the largest collaborative projects involving France, Germany, Great Britain, the United States, Japan. Um, it was publicly funded um, mostly by the NIH here, the Wellcome Trust Center in the Sanger Institute uh, over in Great Britain. Uh, I think the U.S. Department of Energy also funded some of this project. So these were all public sort of tax money um, and uh, was sort of the backing for, for this project right here. And so it started in 1990, but it wasn't until 2000 that they had somewhat of a working draft. And then in 2003, was deemed that it was complete at this time right here. Initially, when they projected the start of the project in 1990, they thought it was, was going to take 15 years. And in, in fact, instead, it took 13 years. So this was what they thought would, would take. So they finished kind of like two years uh, ahead of time. The sample that was involved really wasn't one individual sample. It was actually a, a multiple donors. Um, I believe the reference sequence that ended up being completed somewhere around this time mostly belonged to one male donor, but there were also other individuals involved, females and, and other males involved as well. But you can see sort of the scale of sequencing that it took. This is the public effort. Right? Let me try this now. Public effort. Um, it took 13 years to do many countries, right? I listed Japan, some of the major players, the UK, US, Germany, France. These are the major players here. Many countries, many public labs, uh, NIH funded, part with R01 grants, etc., uh, each sort of doing their own uh, piece of the puzzle. Uh, to come together with the draft, uh, the working draft, and finally the complete draft in 2003. So in parallel with this, there was the private effort. 
The Private Efforts is a venture by Solera, which is a company founded by uh, Craig Venter. Venter was actually an NIH investigator as well. I think he worked um, uh, in, uh, at the NIH, and somehow I forget why he left uh, the NIH, but he went off to set up his own company and got into the business of trying to compete with the public effort. And they started their project in 1998, so a little bit later, quite a bit later, right? Years later. And they sort of also put out a working draft in 2000, and I guess somehow completed as well uh, years after that uh, in terms of, of their results. You can see it didn't take them very long um, the way they did it, uh, but that was the private effort, just that company. Uh, they worked behind the scenes, uh, nothing was shared in public, and it was sort of deemed that the, the two kind of tied each other uh, at the end of the day. I'll get into a bit, little bit more about that uh, later on. So this is the whole scope of the project. We'll kind of put it into perspective later with the costs and everything. But these were the two major sort of driving competing forces during the human, human genome project days. Uh, before it was deemed complete in early uh, 2000 or so. Any questions so far? So how, how did they do this? How did they go about sequencing? So we talked about the different assays in terms of PCR. That was what, mid-1980s, that even? Or early 1980s, mid-1980s when that came into effect. Sanger sequencing was discovered in 1975 by Frederick Sanger, um, and then I guess somehow PCR got incorporated into that uh, in the mid-80s. But if you were setting out in 1990 to do this, to sequence the human genome, really there was only one technology, which was, which was Sanger sequencing, and that was it. You didn't have other options around. Um, to, to, to get at the base level in terms of information about the, the human DNA. So Sanger sequencing was the mode that, that they, they used. Um, but how do you start from a huge, big puzzle, the 23 pairs of chromosomes? And I guess you're doing a half voice, so you would really technically only be doing 23 chromosomes. How do you start from here and go about actually sequencing the human genome? Uh, so let's just throw down some limitations about Sanger sequencing, all right? Just to quickly review. So with Sanger, if you use PCR, I mean, PCR you can do as long as you want, right? 10,000 bases, 20,000 even if you have the right polymerase and the right conditions. But Sanger, the limitation when you combine your DNTPs and your DDNTPs, you really can only get on a good day maybe after 600, 700 bases at best. So that means that you have to work within the context of Sanger sequencing, which gives you perhaps on a good day 600 to 700 base pairs. So if you were just to take the human genome, all 23 chromosomes, and just say, oh, I'm just going to randomly start sequencing 600 or 700 bases, that's very difficult to do. Um, you need to, one, amplify up the target that you're interested in first, right? But the question is, how do you amplify up something you don't know the sequence of? Because this is a de novo sequencing effort. You're starting a new and you have no reference to start from, and you're trying to build up that scaffold uh, as an initial, initial starting point. So this is very hard to do. You can't just say, I'm going to target the KRAS gene, the first exon. You don't even know how many exons KRAS has, right? Unless someone has cloned the gene and actually looked deep into it. So the task of de novo sequencing is quite a bit challenging, right? When you have a technology that doesn't give you very long reads, and also, you don't have any framework to start from uh, to, to design primers for PCR. So the option the, is actually to break this down into smaller pieces so you know what you're working with. And that's what they did, was they took the 23 chromosomes and they broke them down to, into back clones. Or bacteria, bacteria artificial chromosome clones. And these were roughly 150,000 bases. And I... I guess going back to the fish lecture, I, I, I kind of mentioned that we inherited something from the Human Genome Project. And these, in fact, are the same backlogs that we use today to generate fish probes for. Uh, 
So what they did was they took the big bit pieces, broke them down into smaller pieces that are manageable. They can tag it, they can catalog it, and they can say, oh, yeah, this belonged to you know, perhaps this one chromosome or whatever. And so they cloned this uh, fragment of DNA, roughly 150,000 bases, into a, a, a bacterial artificial chromosome. So what a chromosome, uh, a back clone is, is essentially a large, large plasmid. plasmids. Plasmids have basically two key components. One is an origin of replication, and the second is some uh, resistance gene, for example, ampicillin. So the origin of replication allows you to replicate the DNA many, many fold to high purity when you uh, transform them into E. coli. And once you have transformed them into E. coli, you only want those, um, those cells, those bacterial cells that contain the plasmid to survive, right? So that's why you use a resistance uh, marker or a selectable marker here, which is ampicillin, to kill off any E. coli that doesn't have your plasmid and to maintain in culture to high purity and perhaps high copy number the plasmid that you're trying to, uh, to propagate. And that's why you need these two components here. One is to synthesize the DNA within the uh, bacterium, so you're kind of using the bacterium as a factory uh, to amplify up the DNA. And secondly, have a resistance gene here so that you can select for that particular um, clone that you're trying to, uh, to grow up. But the difference between a plasmid, which typically is not very big, 5,000 bases, no more than 10,000 bases, is that there's some special uh, feature in, in this backbone here that allows the the plasmid to be maintained at, in a larger, larger size, which is 150,000 uh, bases or so. And this was uh, a breakthrough in terms of technology uh, uh, around designing the bacterial artificial chromosome. So you can separate it now, right? But now that you you can separate this, say this is you purify the DNA and, and, and it's in this tube right here, you could actually take this and break it down even further into smaller plasmids. So when you do that, you can actually break these down into smaller plasmids, which also have bacterial artificial chromosomes. I mean, I'm sorry, which also has this uh, origin of replication and uh, ampicillin resistance gene. So if you broke it down further, you can actually create sort of a library of these fragments that belong in total to this 150,000 base or so sequence. And you can separate these out by transforming them into E. coli, plating them on a plate, and grow them overnight, and then you have sort of these colonies that form. So each one of these colonies here, each one of these colonies represents one of these plasmids that you could pick, put them into LB culture, very similar to what we do when we make fish probes, and grow them up overnight to confluency, purify out the DNA by DNA extraction, and then now you have a highly pure snip tidbit of this bigger back clone that you're dealing with. And you can catalog these together and say, oh, this belongs to this clone that I'm working with, which belongs to whatever portion of the genome that I think I'm working with, and organize it that way. So what I've, I'm describing to you right now is a very hierarchy in terms of how things are organized with respect to the, the genome. It's at a chromosome level, it's at a backbone level, it's at a plasmid level. So that if you were to sequence this, let's say this one particular piece right here, you sequence it and then you piece it back together, you can make your way back to where it started from in terms of the reference sequence or the, uh, the human genome that you're trying to sequence. So how exactly do you sequence from the small plasmid? So I'm going to draw the small plasmid, origin of replication, ampicillin gene, so I mentioned that we don't know what this is, right? We don't know what the rest of this is. But we do know what this is right here. So what they could do is design a primer that starts from the backbone of the plasmid and then just start sequencing in. And once you've gone in far enough, if you wanted to sequence the rest of this thing, you can re redesign another primer that you figured out from the initial sequencing and essentially just mark all along and get the entire sequence back from this one, one plasmid. So what I've just described to you is essentially the way that the Human Genome Project was, was done uh, on the public side. So they did a hierarchical sort of shotgun sequencing method. So shotgun meaning that 
it's sort of a targeted shotgun because they took this plasmid, which is the bacterial artificial chromosome, and they broke it down into pieces and it's sort of splattering somewhere along here uh, by restriction digest or DNA, so you can create random sort of representations of this sequence right here. So it's sort of like a blasting kind of shotgun approach um, to, to do the sequencing with. The private effort was a little bit different. So this is the public effort. So the private effort is Solera. They started much later and they were like, you know, forget this hierarchy business. I'm just going to take the entire human genome, fragment everything, shear it up, create a large, large library like this. But I don't know where it came from, what backlog, what region of the genome, what chromosome or whatever. I'm just going to do the entire thing as a true shotgun library. And that's what they did. They created a huge library of this. I don't know how large the library volume was and how they were able to plate it out so that they get representation of the entire genome. But that's what they did. They picked the clones, put it into LB Auger, did DNA extraction, sequenced this thing, and what they relied on in the end was a heavy, heavy computing power to piece things back together. And that's how they did it. So they did sort of the lazy approach, whereas the government effort was more of the structured, organized approach. At the end of the day, I kind of mentioned that they tied around 2000 to push out working drafts. But in fact, there is some hearsay, <laughs> and it's probably true, that while the public effort was going on, whenever they had a sequence that was ready, they really just shared it to the entire world uh, through NCBI or GenBank. They would publish the sequence. And it's sort of some hearsay and known fact almost that Solero was probably monitoring that data and kind of helping, using that data to help map their own data. So sort of they were cheating uh, somewhat. So I think at the end of the day, you know, who knows who won, you know, or it was a true tie or not. But the competition was actually a very good thing for the project. It helped speed things along and uh, uh, help uh, things to be completed much faster than what it would. You know, without Solero, you know, kind of breathing on the backs of the government, maybe it would have taken another five years, who knows. Um, but so the competition is always good. So you kind of see this method, right? At the end of the day, it's, it's, it's boiled down to sort of this method. Has anybody ever cloned before, did plates, mm -hmm. mini preps in terms of plasmids? So we're talking about 3 times 10 to the ninth bases, right? And I mentioned, you know, on a good day, maybe it's 600 or so. So 6 times 10 to the second. And let's just say you want to, you can't just sequence once and be confident about that, right? So maybe you do four reverse direction for this. Um, let's just do an N of 3 just to be confident, right? We sequence that thing three times. So times 2 for 4 are reverse, and times 3 for triplication. And let's just make a rough guess. That's 6, right? Uh, so mm -hmm. times 6. So if you take this number divided, it, it's 0.5 times 10 to the 7th. And then times 6 is 3 times 10 to the 7th, right? Mm -hmm. That is 30 million. 30 million picks of this colony. <laughs> 30 million test tubes with LB broth. 30 million epidorph twos of mini extracted DNA, mini, uh, mini preps of DNA. That's a lot of reactions. <laughs> so was it done by having thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of workers who just stood there and picked and did mini preps? No. So one of the key, key pieces that had to be in place to get this project underway and, and done was automation. So back then, if you were to go to the Broad and just went into there, you would see probably just an entire room dedicated to liquid handlers. And I don't even know if they had colony pickers, perhaps even, um, that would pick the colonies, uh, do the mini prep really quickly, set up the you know, reactions or Sanger sequencing, and put it into sort of uh, uh, the ABI machine for sequencing. So one thing was automation to get this underway. Second thing I already mentioned is CE. So CE didn't come about until probably the mid-90s or so, uh, ABI pushing out um, probably one of the first ones for Sanger sequencing. So without this, you would be sequencing on polychromite gels <laughs> that are this big, uh, 
um, pouring gels, doing four reactions, using radioactive uh, labeled primers or whatever uh, for the sequencing step. Um, but I think things improve. Uh, they start with slab gels, I think, um, but still a little bit more automated. And they probably incorporate fluorescent uh, tag nucleotides. But they eventually got into the capillary where you can actually do 24 reactions or 48. And I think at some point they, they use the 3730XL, um, not what we have, which is the 48 well capillary. The 3730XL is a 96 well version. And the pro literally have just hallways and hallways of this uh, dedicated to the human genome project. So it was the bro, it was probably Wash U, Baylor, somewhere in the UK, Sanger Institute, just factories and factories of automation and CD analysis to allow this to happen um, at a fast enough pace so that it could be completed in 13 years. And then the last key, key piece um, in terms of uh, sequencing uh, and the Human Genome Project was the computing, computing power. So I, don't remember, I don't know if you remember, but 1990, were cell phones around yet? No. <laughs> it was the large, large ones, maybe? Mm -hmm. You maybe have, you, were, you weren't carrying around iPods, right? No. You were probably carrying around like a Sony Walkman. Yeah. <laughs> maybe tip cassette, maybe CD player. CD player. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you can imagine the computing power back then in terms of processors wasn't really that great. But the computing power it took to assemble things together, because once you've, you've had this, let's say you sequence this, right? And this is the piece that, that you are able to, um, to sequence out. And then this other one somehow overlaps a little bit. So they, they would literally look at uh, contiguous sequences and put them together into a contig and be able to say, oh yeah, these three pieces or four pieces kind of read together and they must belong to the same region of the genome. So you need a lot of computing power to do that for the millions and millions of uh, textual base sequences that you get back from all of these reactions right here. So you need a lot of RAM, you need a lot of computing power uh, so that you can actually piece the entire hum human genome back together. So these are the three key pieces I thought that was necessary. And when you look at the trajectory of the project, probably there was not much done in 1990 all the way to 1995, 96, maybe even 1997, because some of these weren't really around yet. They were still thinking about how, how to do it. But once this got in place, you literally see an exponential jump in terms of the output of data in, in GenBank and NCBI. Because once these things were in place, things just moved very, very quickly. So if they had to do it all over again, if they had this in place in 1990, maybe it would have finished under 10 years or so instead of taking uh, 13 years. So uh, one tidbit that I, I was re reading recently about was computing. Um, and there was a guy named Jim Kent, uh, who if you go to USC Genome Browser, you'll see probably his name splattered across everywhere. Um, tools like BLAT, for example, BLAST-like uh, sort of search, he was the one who developed that. So at that time, he was actually a PhD student at UCSC uh, Santa Cruz, who hosts the uh, USC, UCSC genome browser that we use extensively today. And he was the one who wrote up the, I think, GIG uh, assembler or something, which was a de novo assembler for, for Sanger sequencing data. And somehow, him and his uh, thesis advisor put together a small commodity cluster of 50 small uh, computer boxes that actually put out the first, was part of the first draft in terms of uh, the 2000 publication. And he was actually competing with Solera, who at that time probably had the most powerful supercomputer in the world working for them. So that was just a um, David versus Goliath kind of <laughs> <laughs> a competition going on. So I thought that was an interesting tidbit. But uh, um, you could just see how, how much complexity that was involved in this entire process. All the key pieces have to be together uh, in order to uh, make this work and happen. So I'm going to draw a graph. Just think of Long's office now and next day starting in the office. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to draw you Solaris stock, okay? I, I, maybe it was something like that. <laughs> That's the year 2000. So they peaked somewhere right before 2000. 2000 were, was when the two publications came out. In Nature was um, when, when, when the the, pub, uh, the working drafts were published. In Nature, it was the public effort, 
and in the in science it was the private effort, and I think they were just off by a day or two, February 13th and 14th. Um, so that's why it was uh, deemed as a tie. Um, but right after the publication, things just kind of fizz for Solera. Do you know what happened at this time? Any guesses? Well, one of them, you know, September 11th, right? Didn't didn't really help with that. There was the biotech bubble, uh, but probably this kind of helped drive the, the nail in the coffin for the biotech sector. Uh, so Solaria, do you think they were in, in this for the good of all mankind? <laughs> no, right? Maybe the public effort was, right? In terms of discovery, um, discovering all the genes, the genetic variations, and et cetera. Solera was in it to patent genes. And eventually, I think when they submitted, I, I heard stories around this time right here, is that when they submitted the, this to the patent office, it was literally stacks and stacks of just paper of sequencing data. <laughs> Look, I sequenced this. I have no idea what it is, but I would like to patent this, this one region of the genome. And they did that for literally like 6,000 or so genes that they thought were genes without even knowing the function of them. So they were in the business of patenting genes. And you know how today how complex it is, right? In, in the molecular diagnostics lab, there are genes like FLT3, JAK2 mutation, uh, ALK, which we do fish for, uh, BRCA1, BRCA2, uh, it's, it's, it's a big thing that genes are patented and that nobody can touch them because they, they are still legit right now. Um, but they were in it for that exact reason, is that they wanted IP rights to these genes so that nobody else would do research on them or you know, use them for diagnostics because um, you would have to go through them to get a license to actually work with those, those uh, regions of the genome. So they were in it for that, but in 2000, Bill Clinton signed into, I guess, law or whatever, that you couldn't patent genes anymore. And that's what sent their stock crashing. And now, if you, I don't even know if Solari still exists. I think they might, but it's probably not penny stocks. Uh, <coughs> because they, they did the human genome, but they haven't done much after that in terms of applying to the data that they have, or jumping into next-gen sequencing, or launching sort of a molecular diagnostics lab. So they haven't done much of anything. So they, they're really just uh, out of the picture now. Um, so. Great, and thanks for their contribution here, but not so much afterwards because they haven't done anything. So that's, that's another interesting tidbit. So let's put things into perspective now. Uh, any questions about the approach? Um, really, it's just saying your sequencing. We already went uh, over that. Um, interestingly, Sanger sequencing is still the golden standard today, right? When you do a next-gen experiment, Sanger sequencing is still what you go back to to confirm. Um, but it was the main technology that was used for uh, sequencing the human genome project. And so let's put things into perspective now. It took 13 years, right? Multiple labs. And I mentioned UK, US, Japan, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, any ideas about the cost? It's in the billions, like three billion or something. Yeah, it's around three billion, three two point seven billion. But that was fiscal year way back in the nineties. So today's amount, due to inflation, easily you know double, triple that, or whatever. Um, so two point seven billion dollars, and it, it was only a haploid genome. And you can see why it took so long, right? It's, it's, it's a not a parallelized process. You, you pick one colony, you do one mini prep, you do one Sanger sequencing, or two, forward reverse, you put it through one capillary run in one well of a 96 well plate. So it was, it's not a surprise that it took such a long time, a lot of money because of all the efforts that's needed to go into each reaction. And one lab would not have been able to do this. Maybe Solera solution, they did it all with, uh, within their company, but maybe they had a very well-oiled machine to, to, to do what they were doing uh, by themselves. So a lot of expertise and everything. So this is very, very complex in terms of processing. So today, let's just put, put into perspective. Today with a next-gen sequencing platform, let's just throw out there an Illumina uh, sequencing. 
uh, instrument. You can get very good high quality data in the 200 to maybe 400, about the 200, let's just say 200 gigabases per run. On a high 62,000, there are two full cells that you can do. You just dedicate one full cell. You can do this roughly in 10 days. Cost, um, raw cost, if I remember correctly, 12 to 13,000. One lab, right? Probably even one person generating the library. One person loading the, um, the, the machine for uh, whatever. And you can probably have one buy from Mac, Max person to do the assembly to put this together. You, you, you still need a hefty supercomputer, a hefty cluster, but one bioinformatician. So, do you see the scale of difference here? Is that instead of 13 years, and actually, let me do this math here 200 gigabases is 200 times 10 to the 9th. Um, and you have 6, right? 6 times 10 to the 9th. These cross out. This is roughly a 30x full coverage genome, you know, which is a decent size uh, coverage to get um, your heterozygous calls from germline uh, conditions or SNPs. So it went from 13 years to 10 days. The informatics will probably take a few more days, uh, etc. But really, <laughs> 10 days versus 10 to 20 days is nothing compared to 13 years, right? Multiple labs, you can do it in one lab. Just one person handling this, one instrument, and the cost. The cost is here 2.7 times 10 to the 9th, and then you have maybe 13 times 10 to the foot. So roughly what? 0. Point, I'm doing this right here. 13, 3, 4, roughly 4, right? 0. 0.4 times 10. Is that right? No, I'm not doing it right. A quarter. 0.25 times 10 to the third. So really, you're, you're jumping orders and orders of magnitude lower. Actually, 10 to the six. <laughs> Five orders of magnitude lower, right? Move the decimal point over one. So it's 2.5 times 10 to the fifth times less cost than what it took the Human Genome Project to do. Um, and that's what next-gen sequencing can do. Next gen sequencing, and this is the human genome project slash first gen. And you can see why there's been a lot of hype. I would say hype and excitement, maybe well founded, maybe some overhype about what next gen can do. Now that you can sequence the entire human genome, what you can do if you could do this in a matter of few days um, with not much effort here. But on the flip side, it's, it also highlights the complexity, right, is that the analysis here took quite a while to put it together. This is still not a trivial thing to do once you get the, the data back for next-gen sequencing. And, but it, it, makes, it, it, it makes things very um, exciting because potentially we could do a human genome sequencing today within a very reasonable time as sort of a clinical assay, if you wanted to do that. Um, but that's, that's the perspective. That's why I wanted to talk about the Human Genome Project first, is to put it into perspective where we came from. And literally, this is, um, what, the end of 2003. It would still be this, right? Um, today, this is 2012. I think even a few years earlier, we were already sort of in this mode right here. The cost was higher, but we were already sort of in this rim right here. So it was a matter of, I would say, seven years that we literally went from here, even in 2005 or so, we're still kind of uh, um, in this mode here. So literally within like six years, five, six years, we have jumped orders and orders of magnitude in terms of throughput, decrease in terms of costs, and decrease or increase in terms of efficiency in terms of next-gen sequencing. So with that, I would like to pause. If you guys want to take a break, you can do that. If not, I can move on to the next thing in terms of next-gen platforms. It gives me more time. So platforms? Yeah. yeah. So any questions about this? Okay.